No matter the location, from the global south to northern Europe, from the Far East to the American West Coast, life in the modern day city is both exhilarating and exhausting. Consider all the different cities you've visited throughout the world. Then try and take a mental picture of what you've seen. Of course, you could focus on the luster of city life, but don't forget about the traffic, the commotion, and the confusion. I recently traveled to Italy with my family, and I was crazy enough to drive through the narrow streets of Rome, where local drivers take stop signs as suggestions. But in the future, the chaos of busy city streets might become distant memories of what city life used to be. The rise of AI technology is making cities smarter. Urban planners and city engineers are teaming up with some of the leading minds in AI. Together, they are streamlining how cities can be more energy efficient, safer, and enjoyable than ever before. Join us as we reimagine urban life and how we interact with our surroundings in the smartest cities yet. Welcome to Technically Speaking, an Intel podcast. Produced by iHeartMedia's Ruby Studio in partnership with Intel. In every episode, we explore how AI innovations are changing the world and revolutionizing the way we live. Hey there, I'm Graham Class. Today we take our episode to the city streets, where AI technology is already making a tremendous impact across the globe. In this episode, we will focus on how Intel's AI technology is impacting local infrastructures and changing the urban landscape. Plus, we'll learn about real-world examples where AI has changed the way residents of one bustling city live, work, and commute every day. But before we go any further, let's welcome our guests. Joining us today is Ashish Yadav, the Head of Strategic Partnership Alliances and Technical Product Marketing at Capgemini, a global leader in partnering with companies to transform and manage their business by harnessing the power of technology. Capgemini has partnered with Intel to develop the 5G roadside unit, which will improve 5G communications between traffic monitoring cameras, sensors, vehicles, and pedestrians, making cities run smoother and safer for everyone. Welcome to the show, Ashish. Thank you, Graham. It's so nice to be here this morning. We're also joined by JVS Ramakrishna, a technology expert who lives in Hyderabad, India where local authorities have leaned on Intel Xeon servers as part of the solution to address challenges around effective traffic management and ensure public safety as the city has expanded beyond its limits. The strategy has improved traffic flow significantly by identifying congestion hotspots and dynamically adjusting signal timings, helping optimize travel times citywide. Welcome to the show, JVS. Thank you, Graham. Pleasure to be here in the show. I think before we start discussing solutions on making our cities smarter, I'd like to get both of your thoughts about some of the common challenges cities face. When some people think of, you know, busy city life, they think of congestion, think of traffic, they think of safety concerns. I'm sure some of our audience right now is listening to us while in a traffic jam. When it comes to infrastructure, how can we plan our cities? What sticks out as the common problem most cities face? I'll start with you, Ashish. So traffic is definitely one of the most challenging part of city life. And there are many ways to solve it. But for me also personally, I have a lot of thoughts around how we can do it. Let's continue to talk and we can delve more into it. Absolutely. JVS? While technology plays a very important role, you know, I come from part in India where traffic is like all pervasive. I mean, it's like everywhere. And, and you would see millions of people on the roads. but I think it starts with master urban planning. Urban planning is the key in terms of the city growth and how do the road infrastructure is planned, then follows the technology infrastructure. The cities are already planned. You cannot erase the lines and create new roads. But I still feel technology can do a lot of good, even with all those, I would say, misplanned (laughs) roads, right? That's where the power of technology comes in. Yeah, and um, it's interesting you say that because generally cities have been planned from a historical perspective. For example, in Perth, it was an agricultural type city a long time ago. So the roads are designed for getting access to farmlands. And now it's, you know, obviously the metropolitan area has grown. And 
perhaps that leads us into what is a smart city. Maybe we could start, Ashish, with what's your definition of what a quote-unquote smart city is? So I would say a smart city is a city that is keeping the efficiency and quality of life of its citizens at the foremost, where I would say you are using and integrating technology and communication efficiently so that everyday life becomes easier and the challenges become less and less as the city becomes smarter and smarter. JBS? I've been trying to figure out this definition for the last no, eight, nine years now. <laughs> Just to set the context, you know, uh, cities like San Francisco, Perth and all, they've been planned historically. But most of the developing world, where there are a lot of infrastructure activities happening, I think that's where they have an opportunity to replan. But the problem statements are different to different cities. What is a smart city in one small town of India where they had a problem of unpredictable water supply? So people were like probably queuing up late night, you know, waking up for water supply. If they get an SMS, they know exactly when it's going to come, the water is going to come, right? So that's smart for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas in big cities like Mumbai and Hyderabad, it's all about traffic, safety, utilities, and you know, waste management, so on. So I think the definition varies, but ultimately it's all about reduction of the wastage, efficiencies, quality of life. I come from a small village in India. And near our village, there is hardly any water. And today that area is thriving. We may talk about a first world country where smartness is more to do with sensing so that I don't have to wait even one minute on a traffic light to somebody in a third world country or a less developed country where even getting that water is smart. I agree with you. And that actually leads us to thinking more about these sorts of smart solutions. Ashish, you've worked with 5G commercializations for a number of years now. Before we get into the role 5G plays in smart cities, we're going to be hearing in this podcast episode the term RSU or roadside unit a lot. Can you just help us dissect what this actually means? What does 5G RSU mean? So 5G is not just a fast data on your phone or that 5G icon on your right top corner of your phone. It enables much more because of the low latency and high speed of the data. For example, these roadside units could be just single server, harmless small server sitting somewhere, and that could monitor and sense if there is traffic. They can even sense if there is a pedestrian on the way, the autonomous vehicle can take a break. So they could enable that kind of interaction between the pedestrian and the car. Mm -hmm. They could ensure that the lights, the signals are to the point where there is less and less congestion. So it could be making your traffic smarter. Because of the low latency, you could have all those signals going out to the vehicles, to the phones, if not the smart cars, and then making it consistent. Also, the signals on the lights, based on the sensors on where the pedestrians are, where you could prioritize the pedestrians, you could prioritize the bikers, you could prioritize the congestion, all those things can be done with the RSUs. I'm just thinking of another scenario, particularly around school zones where I live. You know, it'd be nice to be able to prioritize school students crossing the road or notifying cars to slow down and, and watch out during those pick up and drop off times at school. So, Graham, the thing is, once you have connectivity, once you have cameras, the use cases expand. They can tailor to your needs. You could even sense based on the height, based on the uniforms, based on timing. You could do all those wonderful things. It's just a matter of your imagination and how far you can take it. And you've talked a little bit about the technological benefit of the 5G protocol. Why is 5G a game changer? All right. Thank you. This is my favorite topic <laughs> because I really believe 5G is going to make the change that's needed in the society. When LTE came, you could see a lot of applications. You could see a lot of enablement of the app stores. But still, latency was a big concern. With 5G, the latency reduced, the throughput increased. So now you can be in more reliable situations. So LT was a good step because it moved from just the voice calls to more an application world. Mm. But with 5G, 
you can take it to a real life level. You're just not playing games. You're moving beyond. You're impacting and touching real lives now on traffic signals, on waste management systems, on power grids. And these are all real examples that are happening in cities. You see it in Singapore, you see it in Barcelona, you see it in Dubai. So, so many of these countries are already deploying these use cases. Let's pause here for a second to analyze what Ashish just said. You heard her mention both LTE and 5G and the differences between the two. LTE stands for long-term evolution. And when it was introduced, it served as a significant upgrade from existing 3G technology, but it only offers a speed of 100 megabits per second. 5G, on the other hand, delivers up to 20 gigabits per second. That's a speed improvement of 200 times. Now, 5G Near Edge is the intersection of two technologies, 5G network technology and edge computing. It brings the power of local computing in your home, in your car, or at the traffic lights together with high-speed mobile networks. All this means is that these edge computers can make super fast decisions at the locations where it's critically needed. With that in mind, I asked Ashish how Capgemini's roadside units work and how 5G technology can help vehicles communicate with one another to ensure safety on the road. So, Roadside units and autonomous vehicles will go hand in hand. This will become more relevant when the autonomous vehicles come into play. So imagine a traffic signal not needed. Mm. That could be the future. Why is it needed today? Because when somebody takes a break, a other person needs to come in. What if you can coordinate the two vehicles the edge can tell the vehicle at this moment this vehicle is going to intersect so you don't need to stop you can slow down and then the same signal from vehicle to vehicle can go to other vehicles which can tell them to slow down so the traffic might slow down a bit but you don't need to stop on a traffic signal that's the extent that it can go to because there's a communication between vehicle to vehicle there's a communication between signal to vehicle so for now it can be more efficiency, but going forward, it can be autonomous. That's the future of it. And uh, JVS, where have you seen other areas or other cities that have used this sorts of roadside technology? And it's a two-parter kind of question is that plus using some of the new kind of AI type technology that's coming about and being able to improve the overall infrastructure of these cities? Yeah, so this technology has been extensively adopted in in India. More than 100 cities have implemented more or less similar technologies where roadside units play a significant role. The biggest challenge is traffic enforcement in this part of the world. And to do the traffic enforcement, we need to consistently read the license plate numbers in terms of the violations, whether they're crossing the red light or somebody's coming in the opposite direction and so on and so forth. It's extremely important from latency point of view because the moment you process, it has to coordinate with the red light and decide whether it's a violation or not. And then it has to immediately notify the violation along with the evidences. I can really see this RSU getting more useful for violations because in India, it's a very common practice for people to not honor the traffic light. So one of the things that's happening these days and which is leading to very good traffic management in India is those sensors on the traffic lights. And with the RSU kind of a situation, you can read the number plate and you can get to the violators automatically. And I hear that these days, a lot of tickets that are coming to homes with that. At this moment, we run 25 smart city command centers. Almost every city has got this feature. And trust me, in some intersections, the moment the tickets come, Next day morning, you would find everybody be behind the line. So it's, it's, it's quite effective in this part of the world. Yeah. That might also lead me to, I guess, another challenge. Particularly, I'd like to get your thoughts about India's overall approach to this because in Europe and America and in some regards, Canada and Australia, we are very much concerned about some of the privacy aspects of this, of the sensors and cameras and being able to automatically detect violations and things like that. How are some of the safeguards being put in place so that it can protect people's information about themselves and their movements? First of all, 
all this data that is being captured at the near edge is anonymous. Means you have license plates, you won't have any information about that uh, person because there is nothing called people database here. Number two, most important thing is that once you get the data, once the tickets are generated, it goes into the data centers where the data privacy is given the most highest priority in terms of data availability point of view. Let me chime in on the technology part that takes care of this. The moment edge comes into play, security does become a concern because you are out of the data center whole security now, especially when you are on a standalone edge. But the best part about edge is also that the data is with the enterprise. If it's the police department or the traffic management department that's handling the edge, then the data is only with that department. Okay, great. And we've talked a lot about the edge and near edge and kind of related to the privacy issue. Are you working with that data in terms of generating new AI models or some sort of machine learning side of things to continually improve the system as a whole? That is correct. That data, even when it's anonymous, can be used for analytics and can be fed into the machine learning engine so that it can create more insights as well as more behavior modification for the use cases going forward, enabling more efficiency for the users. Absolutely, yes. Okay. We do very extensively the data from an anonymous point of view, but we are also wary of the fact that depending on where we put the sensors, where we collect the data, there are a lot of biases also get introduced into the system. So there is always some sort of judgment that comes from the officers there, whether whether the model is really reasonably unbiased is always a challenge, which we have been uh, tackling uh, on a regular basis. For example, we know how to protect the traffic. We even know where most of the vehicles are stolen and how, where to get retrieve them and, and what not. I mean, everything is known. Coming up next on Technically Speaking, an Intel podcast. There's a huge appetite in public infrastructure to adopt technology. I think uh, we need to focus more and more on affordable use cases. We'll be right back after a brief message from our partners at Intel. Welcome back to Technically Speaking, an Intel podcast. I'm here now with Ashish Yadav and Javias Ramakrishna. I'll switch now a little bit to perhaps a real world case study. JVS, you live in Hyderabad, incredibly busy city in India. I'd like you to introduce the city to the audience and how many people live there, how do you describe the city and maybe a bit of a day in the life of a typical resident and some of the challenges that they face. Absolutely, absolutely. That's been my favorite subject for some time. Hyderabad is one of the upcoming fastest growing city in Asia and it is in the southern part of the India give and take maybe more than uh, 10 million population, but it has got two distinct qualities. One part of the city is 400 years old legacy city. The other part of the city is akin to probably a San Francisco or Perth. So what we were able to do is we planned almost, I think 10,000 uh, cameras and 100,000 community cameras to be brought into one network. There's a huge massive command center that has been put in from the security point of view, which is very normal in any city. But what is more important here is the city has taken a view of to do more and more use AI from the safety point of view to identify the hotspots and uh, coordinate with the first responders or patrolling vehicles to go on time and all. So what I should tell you is that in the whole process using AI and the core technology, they were able to improve on first responders time to average to around 8 minutes from first while 15 to 20 minutes. Mm. Very important. The safety parameters are so well monitored by the government. I think that's a plus point for the city. The crime rates have come down. Second part is on the traffic side. A lot of work has gone into master planning, especially in the new part of the city. And almost around 225 intersections were having traffic enforcement. Technologies could be red light violations, speed, and all camera-based, vision-based analytics. Mm -hmm. And also to really identify the patterns of the traffic and help the transportation planning, we have even put in close to 175 intersections, the ATCC cameras, 
we should do the traffic classification and counting. This actually helped us to give a real-time congestion index in every arm of the intersection. Okay. So the number of possibilities are very high using technologies, but all of these things use vision, they use edge compute, they use AI. AI technology didn't just help city officials in Hyderabad deal with issues of traffic and congestion. It also allowed the city to share infrastructure information across various agencies so that they could improve the safety, security and quality of the utility companies. City officials can also plan better for big events like how many cars and how many people will stream into their city on any given day. And they can prepare accordingly to ensure greater public safety for everyone involved. And all of those insights are dependent on AI. Going back to the technology and the solution, JVS, you're part of the LNT Technology Services, which actually created the LTTS Fusion platform. Can you tell us a little bit about that platform and what role Intel played in its AI functionality? Sure. What we found is that there are many applications, IT applications, which are coming in trying to solve the traffic problem or trying to solve the safety problem and so on. But at a city level, when we started analyzing so many cities, we found that you need to have a platform which can actually try to get the insights out of geospatial data, video data, structured data, all together and generate some insights or recommendations to the operator there. So we have got into this act, created what we call Fusion. It's LTTS platform. So this platform has got a feature of developing applications on the top of it. Could be traffic, could be safety, or could be multi-agency operations. Video ingestion has been the core technology for us, which is where we have been working with Intel. Most of our infrastructure runs on Intel architecture here, and uh, it's quite useful from that perspective. But what we're also trying to do now in North America is we started working with Intel primarily to use some of the components like uh, Getty and Scenescape to actually do a lot of edge side analytics, especially from the highways point of view. And we get the insights and on the top of it, we are now able to put in a fusion platform from the command center point of view, which will throw analytics, which will do sort of business rules or it can throw recommendations on the top of it. And when you're implementing it, what's the top challenge you faced? There is a big need in this part of the world, in this type of traffic, to have a green channel for any ambulance going in. We have tried a lot of technologies to really communicate using radios, wherein the ambulance goes and then the signal turns green and so on and so forth. But the challenge is, considering the latencies, considering the infrastructure what we have, it didn't really scale the way we want. Probably technologies like 5G will ease out to some extent. But the, still the challenge in terms of clearing the people from the intersection in this part of the world after it turns green is still going to be on the ground. There's a huge appetite in public infrastructure to adopt technology. I think uh, we need to focus more and more on affordable use cases. And this is actually now a question for both of you. How do you see 10 years in the future, given the growth and speed of technology development, as well as societal changes and being more adoptive of these sorts of technologies. Ashish, where do you think we're going to be in 10 years' time? So, Graham, in 10 years, not just technology challenges, we're going to have these natural resource challenges that are going to intensify. So using them efficiently is going to be one of the key challenges. Let's talk with very basic things, water, energy. The usage is something that you see cities saying, if you water your gardens, you will be penalized. Still, you go for a walk on the sidewalk, you see overflowing gardens with water and lush green grass. So you can definitely have observation units that can send data to cities. Especially in a country like United States, you cannot have people resources patrolling from the city. Mm. So you certainly can have sensors that can send the data to city. You can certainly have energy efficiently being used in terms of renewable energy. If some areas are producing excess energy, it can be diverted to other areas which need more. And you can have tabs on which areas use and why. And you can even go to the extent of making those appliances more energy efficient based on the analytics. So 
in my opinion, energy is going to be a key factor in terms of how we will see the world change in next 10 years. Technology will continue to grow. We have to channelize it towards how do we make it more efficient so that we use minimal without impacting the quality of life for people. Javier, where do you see ourselves in 10 years? The biggest challenge is going to be because of the limited resources on the planet. I think sustainability is the where I think all of us actually will have to spend a lot of time and energy and money in the technology supporting sustainability either in terms of environment, water, power, renewable sources and so on and so forth. While we are talking about all these things, I think what also comes to my mind is the cyber security is going to be an extremely important uh, aspect. The more connected we are in, the more the cyber security is going to disrupt the way we do and our habits down the line. I think uh, these are the two things which are going to change the way we live. And living in the United States, in case you are hit with some natural disaster, the quick recovery in terms of using the technology to ensure that the areas can be brought up quickly, that's another thing that technology will play a big role in. Yeah, and I like the fact that, you know, we have talked about the big cities, but I also talked about some of the technology going to the, the smaller cities. And I think that's what it's all about is the technology being able to be diffused to all corners of the a planet. And uh, just with that, I think we'll leave it there. So thank you so much for your time. And JVS, listening to you, I would like to visit Hyderabad the next time I'm in India. <laughs> you are welcome, Ashish. I think uh, you should visit the way they are doing. Seeing is believing. All right. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you, JVS. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to both of you. Thank you, Graham, for the time. And Ashish, thank you. Pleasure meeting you all. Thank you to Ashish and JVS for the insights to today's episode of Technically Speaking. Many of you listening to this podcast will have experienced the frustrations of city traffic, stuck on freeways, roundabouts, and intersections. My takeaway from this discussion is that using the new advances in low cost, low power, highly efficient edge devices will reduce the time spent commuting in your car. Think about it this way. If the adoption of smart city technologies saves you just 10 minutes a day, or five minutes each way in commuting, the time saving will compound and mean an extra full week to spend with your family and friends per year. According to the World Bank, currently 56% of the world's population live in cities. This is projected to increase to 70% by 2045. I believe that cities with a high livability score will attract the best talent and the best investment if they can utilize the new trends in AI, edge devices and computing techniques to improve the life of residents. As with all technology, privacy protections of the individual must be topmost in mind, as we may fall into an unwanted scenario of feeling like we're always being watched. However, I am confident that if we continue to examine and discuss the potential of smart city technology and use AI ethically, we will see metropolises from all corners of the globe continue to grow and prosper. Join us again on Tuesday, June 4th. We'll be exploring the technologies impacting the future of retail. Technically Speaking was produced by Ruby Studio from iHeartRadio in partnership with Intel and hosted by me, Graham Class. Our executive producer is Molly Socha. Our EP of post-production is James Foster. And our supervising producer is Nakia Swinton. This episode was edited by Sierra Spreen and written by Nick Fershaw.